Okay, welcome everyone, welcome. Um, <laughs> um, I need to make an announcement first before we, we start off the program. There is a car blocking another car. <laughs> if you are driving a silver Hyundai, license plate A41AYZ, uh, please go to the back of the room and um, take care of that situation. You're, you're blocking someone in. Okay, I don't see anyone getting up right away, so <laughs> hopefully we can resolve that situation. Well, good evening. Um, I'm Ann Shopper Englot. I'm the co-director of Express Newark, a community university collaboratory, and I would like to welcome you tonight on behalf of my co-director, Victor Davson. Thank you for joining us on this momentous night, and I just have to tell you, get ready, because we have genius here tonight. <laughs> um, tonight you will be blessed to hear from MacArthur genius, Carrie Mae Weems, who will be presenting present tense. And then blessed again because we have an opening and reception for In Pursuit of Beauty, a very special show of photographs by fellow MacArthur genius, Dr. Deborah Willis. <laughs> and I hope you will all also uh, take a walk into the Paul Robeson Galleries and see uh, Dr. Deborah Willis has a photograph there that features Carrie Mae Weems, which is very special. So we are truly blessed tonight. And for all these blessings, uh, we want to give special thanks to our sponsors. First, the sponsors of this lecture, L&M Development Partners. You. And then the Prudential Foundation, PSE&G Foundation, Bank of America, Panasonic, the Kresge Foundation, and of course, Rutgers University, Newark. I also want to thank, uh, take this moment to thank our team here at Express Newark. We wouldn't be sitting here tonight without Crystal Johnson, I mean, Crystal Grant. Sorry, Crystal. <laughs> <laughs> Reading ahead. Thank you. Crystal Grant has been amazing putting this show together and helping everybody along with all the details. Um, also, Eric Johnson, Michael Stashu, Talisha Johnson, Anthony Alvarez, Dina Damiani, Bryant LeBron, Ashley Davison, and Tara Douglas have all worked very hard to make this night possible. Um, and as well as the Price Institute team, Mark Krasovic, who will be here in a second, Laura Troiano, and Rebecca Lesperance. Please join me in a round of applause for our amazing sponsors and our fabulous teams. So Express Newark is neither the community nor the university. We're somewhere in between. We're what scholars call a third space. And as a third space, the artists, curators, and arts organizations in this space see the arts as a medium to foster publicly engaged scholarship, to engage in social practice, and to initiate difficult dialogues across race, gender, and class on issues that matter to all of our Newark communities and beyond. And this is what we're here to do tonight. So let's get started. Uh, please join me in welcoming my esteemed colleague, Dr. Mark Krasovic, Interim Director of the Clement A. Price Institute on Ethnicity, Culture, and the Modern Experience, and Assistant Professor of History and American Studies, who will introduce our dear friend, Nikki Green. Mark. Good evening. On behalf of all of us at the Clement A. Price Institute, I offer welcome and thanks to you all for being here for our third L&M Development Partners Lecture with Carrie Mae Weems. 
The LNM Lecture Series is a sustained reflection on the work that goes on in this building and around the university as a whole to forge connections among university units, the arts, the humanities, the natural and social sciences, between the university and the wider world, beginning with our immediate neighbors here in Newark and the greater Newark region, and between our understandings of history and our present moment. And we strive to bring speakers to this podium who might serve as models for us and help us think through the work we do as engaged artists and scholars. And I feel like I have to say this every time when I say something like this, that, that doesn't mean that artists and scholars are two separate sets of people. That's certainly not true here um, in Express Newark. And perhaps no one exemplifies this concern for history and current events and constant innovation and breaking down boundaries between artistic genres and modes of working than Carrie Mae Weems. She will have a, a, a proper introduction in a moment, but I want to begin my thanks with her. Um, you do us a great honor being here with us tonight, and from all of us at the Price Institute, thank you very much. Um, I want to thank uh, two, uh, Pam Vanderswan and Petra Zilagi at the Carrie Mae Weems Studio. Um, and, and a lot of this will be repeat from what Anne said, so I'll run through it quickly. To the sponsors of this series, our friends at LNM Development Partners and its CEO, Ron Molis, who spearheaded the reimagining and renovation of this historic space and who have been committed to ensuring the vibrancy of its second life. Thank you, too, to Chancellor Nancy Cantor and her staff for arranging the series and being committed to its success. To our wonderful hosts, Anne Englott and Victor Dasson, Express Newark, and the entire Express Newark team, you heard their names right, Crystal, Talisha, Eric, Michael, and many others. To our enduring friends and partners at the Shine Portrait Studio, Nick Klein, Anthony Alvarez, and Kalia Brooks. Um, a special thank you and welcome back to Professor Deb Willis, who's a longtime friend of Professor Price, our namesake, and of the Price Institute. It's always good to have you here. And finally, to my co please. And to my colleagues at the Price Institute, Laura Traiano and Rebecca Lesperance, who help conceive our events and then actually do the hard work of making them happen. Um, and finally, and especially to Nikki Green, who will introduce our distinguished guest tonight. Professor Green is the right person for the job for a number of reasons. Um, as you will remember, she was the inaugural LNM lecturer here almost one year ago and spoke movingly um, of the role Newark played in her development as a scholar of visual art. She is now an assistant professor of art and an art historian at Wellesley College who has written prolifically across a range of op-eds, exhibition catalogs, academic journals, and edited volumes about race, public art, arts pedagogy, and about a dizzying number of artists, including Alma Thomas, Romar, uh, Romar Bearden, Joyce J. Scott, David Hammonds, Renee Stout, and she has a new essay coming out in September, I believe, on Maria Magdalena Campos Pons, Carrie Mae Weems, and Black Feminist Performance. In 2016-17, she was a fellow at the W.E.B. Du Bois Research Institute at Harvard, where she was finishing up, uh, finishing up her forthcoming book, Rhythms of Glue, Grease, Grime, and Glitter, The Body in Contemporary African American Art. It is a great joy to have her back at Rutgers and at this podium. So please welcome Professor Nikki Green. Wow, I'm back home. This is awesome. Thank you. It is always good to be back, and I missed you all dearly since last May. Um, and I am thrilled to introduce Carrie Mae Weems. It is such an honor, but I'll go on about that in a minute. Um, I also want to say that I'm so glad to be here for the opening of Dr. Deborah Willis's exhibition, curated by Kalia Brooks. Um, and it must be said, and I think for the artists and scholars in the room um, who know Deb, you probably feel like she is your personal mentor, um, right? Deb is my mentor. And that's because she, from the very start, once she meets you, she will track you, she will connect you, she will make sure you're doing okay. If you wind up at a dinner, she makes you sit next to her so you catch up. Um, and I first met Deb when I was a first year student at the University of Delaware in graduate school. And, um, and from there on, you've been, you've been one of these beacons for me. So I'm so thrilled to be here with you. 
So, Carrie Mae Weems, please prepare yourself for one of the best audiences that you will ever encounter. I have to let you know that my hometown is unmatched by any other. Um, I'm a post-riots baby, um, born from parents who wanted to be here to raise their children among loving people, people who would look out for each other, um, who would root for each other despite whatever the odds. Um, and since you're a MacArthur genius, we know you don't necessarily need the extra support um, to let you know how we feel about you, but you will indeed get lots of love tonight um, that is really genuine and really, really earnest. And so, in the spirit of Express Newark, um, I have to say that being here last May has truly, truly sustained me um, and is really one of the highlights of my professional career. And so, you have a captive audience tonight. Um, and when I was last here, I quoted Toni Morrison um, from her article called No Place for Self-Pity, No Room for Fear that was published in 2015 in the nation's 150th anniversary issue. And Professor Morrison starts off the article expressing her despondence over the 2004 re-election of George W. Bush. And it was paralyzing her writing. A friend responded, no, no, no. This is precisely the time when artists go to work. Not when everything is fine, but in times of dread, that's our job. Morrison concludes the article with the following statement. No, this is precisely the time when artists go to work. There is no time for despair, no place for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. We speak, we write, we do language. That is how civilizations heal. Carrie Mae Weems has been doing this work, speaking, writing, doing language, doing visual language, um, in a way that I've been so moved by. Um, and I think you've been doing it as long as you've been able to move your body on a stage, um, in front of a camera, or in front of any audience, really. Um, and so it's inevitable that I too would pin my own words from your inspiring career, as was mentioned um, in my forthcoming essay, Habla la Madre, Maria Magdalena Campos Pons, and Black Feminist Performance. And, you know, I, I, I just have a copy, so. <laughs> my card is, is on there. Um, those are just the page proofs, but yeah. Okay, um, just happen to have it, just happen to have it. One cannot write meaningfully about photography or portraiture without writing about Carrie Mae Weems. For over 30 years, she has been defining the limitless boundaries of the photographic lens, the gaze, the body, and self-portraiture, filmic and stage performances. And I want to speak directly about one particular experience I had with being engaged with her work and her genius, engineering um, really a host of artistic spirits. So if you allow me, I will quote myself here. <clears throat> On April 27th, 2014, Maria Magdalena Campos Pons costumed in a startlingly white hoop dress, pro processed into the rotunda and up the ramps, leading to the second floor galleries of the Guggenheim Museum in New York, shouting incantations to the hundreds of visitors. The performance titled Habla la Madre took place during Carrie Mae Weems' live past tense, future present, a weekend of, perform of programming featuring artists' talks, music, and conversations in celebration of the exhibition, Carrie Mae Weems' Three Decades of Photography and Video. How many of you got a chance to see that show? It's just inspiring, right? Um, so Campos Pons invoked the Afro-Cuban Orisha Yemeya, a Yoruba-derived goddess which led to an unprecedented physical and spiritual embodiment of the Guggenheim. 
Carrie Mae Weems specifically asked that Magda and Leonard um, and Neil Leonard perform Habla La Madre on Sunday around the typical time to attend church, marking their performance specifically as a ritual, religious ritual with the Guggenheim standing in place for the worship. And so as she processed, I claim that as Magda wore that Guggenheim shaped dress, she offered her Afro-Cuban body as a site of the African diaspora and feminism in harmony with Carrie Mae Weems and in dissonance with the museum space, serving to complicate pro performance art as portraiture within contemporary art. Here is one of the incantations that um, Magda uh, shouted in the lobby. Obatala, Eshu, Ogun, Shango, Oya. Take all of me and guide me in these few moments. It took a long time for us to be here. Dear mother, owner of the water and the deep sea, bless Carrie, who kicked the door open and let us enter here. Weems, like Campos Pons, is a descendant of enslaved Africans. She was born in Portland, Oregon in 1953 to a family of sharecroppers from Tennessee and Mississippi. And in 2014, the Frisch Center for the Visual Arts in Nashville opened the traveling show, the retrospective of Carrie Mae Weems' three decades of photography and video, which then moved to the Guggenheim, among other sites. But at the Guggenheim, it was the first solo exhibition by a woman of African descent to ever be hosted at that museum. And since, the only. And yes. <laughs> Carrie Mae Weems kicked the door open in the, uh, to the Guggenheim using um, Magda's words. And what I've noticed is that that seems to be her modus operandi. The Carrie Mae Weems live program, which I still have from 2014, I kept it. So I know all who performed, even if I wasn't able to make it to them. Um, that, the, the, that weekend, she, had, she featured a concert by the late Jerry Allen, a jazz pianist with whom she had collaborated for years, a reading by poet Asia Monet, and others, and conversations with artists, curators, and historians, such as the sculptor Barbara Chase Ribu, Thelma Golden, the director and chief curator of the Studio Museum in Harlem, Okwi and Weiser, the director of House der Kunst and the director of the visual arts section of the 2015 Venice Biennale. And she most recently did the same kind of engagement at the um, Armory. So because of that, um, because of this legacy, every single semester, I have at least one or two students who do research on you. Um, at the Davis Museum at Wellesley College, we own a triptych from the Sea Island series um, titled Ebo Landing. And just recently, one of my students, Alexa Krasner, um, wrote her final paper on the set of images in relationship to Julie Dash's Daughters of the Dust, as well as Beyonce's music video, Love Drought, as part of her video suite from the Lemonade album. Um, and so what I was appreciated about that was that Alexa was able to see your work and contextualize it with the history of the Gullah and Geechee people of the, of the Sea Islands within black film, together um, with popular culture and music, because that is what your work is able to do. Bring together these disparate, seemingly disparate aspects of American culture, bring them together. And for that, I think we are all grateful that you are molding future scholars um, for the future and artists that will follow in your footsteps. And so um, I won't take up too much more time here. I will end with mentioning my um, fellow scholar friend sister, Kimberly Juanita Brown, who notes in her book, The Repeating Body, Slavery's Visual Resonance in the Contemporary, she, she talks about um, your roaming series. Um, and she says, quote, with Weems back turned away from the viewer, as she faces disparate structures around the Italian capital of Rome, 
the viewer must enter the frame through her, or at least with her permission. And so entering the frame through Carrie Mae Weems or with her permission means that she is the intermediary, especially in relationship to architecture, but also quite poignantly through photography. Therefore, as we saw on the staging, at least that I got to experience um, in that weekend, that perfect weekend past tense, future perfect at the Guggenheim, Carrie Mae Weems challenges the power of that institution, not just on the walls, but in the presence of so many artists of African descent who could play, sing, read, converse, and roam through the Guggenheim that weekend, and by extension throughout the four months of the exhibition, and then from there to have the voice and spirit of Carrie Mae Weems through Yemeya and the many ancestors of African descent. So, um, I didn't intend to be at that performance. I had come to Newark because my mother was ill at the, um, Rutgers University Hospital and I'd come down to see her. And I decided to go to New York to experience this while she rested one day. And um, I really and truly felt called to be there. And it was, hmm. It was your show in presence of all those, oh wow, okay. It was your show in presence of all those many, many artists, scholars, friends, sisters, and brothers that you were responsible for gathering that drew me there and where I left strengthened. I left different than when I entered the space. And for that, I'm grateful to introduce you to my students um, at Wellesley College every semester. I'm honored to have you included not only in my essay, but also in my forthcoming book, and I'm humbled, really, to share this space with you tonight and to introduce you to my folks here at Express Newark. Please give Miss Carrie Mae Weems a rounding big Newark welcome. Carrie Mae Weems. What an introduction, right? I mean, what an amazing speaker. I thought, I was just like so involved with you. I thought, I'm just, what a wonderful woman. I just want to sit here. Right? And now I have to talk. I have to follow you. Thank you, Nikki. What an honor. Thank you. All of this, thank you so, so much. I have to say, really, um, the thing that um, gives me perhaps uh, the, 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 the greatest strength um, is my amazing girlfriend, Deborah Willis, who is here. And um, so when I think about the people that have guided us, that have shown us a way, that has worked more complexly than anybody that I have ever met in my entire life, and I truly mean that, it is Deborah Willis. Thank you for widening the path. Thank you for making the work that we all do possible that 95% of the people in this room are here and doing their work because of what you have done for us. That I've known you for over 30 years, pushing 40, that my family knows your family, that my sisters know your sisters, that my mother knows your mother. <laughs> Don't break my heart. <laughs> mother is here. Oh, Lord, oh. <laughs> Mother Ruth, Mother Ruth, Mother Ruth. Deborah and I talk a lot. 
We don't get a chance to see each other all the time, but we talk a lot. And a lot of what we talk about is the work that we have to do and uh, the work that means so much to us. Um, I think where we come from, how we've been informed has really shaped what we do and how we do it. Um, I am honored, but I'm also, uh, I'm just doing my work. I don't know what else to do. I'm just doing the work I think that needs to be done. Um, and so I'm simply uh, honored and I'm grateful that I have the opportunity to do the work, Yvonne. <laughs> right, that I have uh, the chance to do the work really is the thing that matters most to me. Uh, and uh, I think that you know, when I lay my body down and when you've all gone as far as you can go with me, the only thing that I'm hoping that you will really remember is the work that was done and that it had meaning and that it had purpose. Can we bring the house lights down, please? I hope they go down. So, okay, but we'll start. Um, one of the things that's really most important to me are, are the ways in which um, artists influence one another and they guide one another and they motivate one another and they cherish one another and they nourish one another and they point for one another and they lead the path for one another. And so I'm always like involved with what other artists are doing. I spend probably a great deal of my time, I wake up in the morning and I think about what other artists are doing and I think about the ways in which they are uh, influencing me and I'm thinking about the way in which they do what they do, all right, and the energy that it takes for them to do what they do and what it gives me, the allowance that it gives me to do what I want to do, right? I remember, you know, like reading Toni Morrison for the first time, I read Toni Morrison on my knee. Right? I would hear, like, read passages that were so exquisite, you know, that spoke so profoundly to the essence of me that the only thing I could do was get on my knees and say, right? <laughs> right? You know, or reading Tolstoy for the first time and, and, and realize, you know, that I wasn't a horse, that I wasn't Anna, that I wasn't a teacup, but I was actually sitting in a room somewhere by myself in a little town that I was completely transported by his ideas and by his writing. I'm constantly listening to music. I love all kinds of music, whether it's Nina Simone or Frank Sinatra and on and on and on and on and on and on. And I've been doing a lot of thinking and a lot of reading and a lot of lecturing actually around these ideas about influence. Within the visual arts, within the visual arts, even though there's a great sense of, you know, that yes, we are influenced by one another, that there are, there's a great history, there's a great history of making, right, that all informs the practice. How many of you are artists? So I know who I'm talking to. Okay. All right, more than half the crowd, right, you're artists, right? So you're always looking, you're always looking, and you're trying to figure out how to make. Whether you are an artist by, by, as a visual artist, or you're a writer, or you're a dancer, or you're a scholar, or you're a scientist, it's all creative, right? It's the, the creative impulse that I think is important. And so I've been thinking a lot about, a lot about music and uh, the ways in which in music, if you don't know the standards, right? If you don't know the standards, if you don't know A-Train, right, there's a problem. Right? If you can't play it, really? There's a fucking problem. <laughs> right? In the visual arts, right, the idea of appropriation is slightly different. Ideas in, around copyright and who owns what is really different, right? And so I'm really sort of thinking a lot about that because I, of course, involve, engage in appropriation often over the course of the work. You know, um, recently, not long ago, I was given, like, a miraculously, uh, a, a, an award along with the great Aretha Franklin. Now, how this happened, I do not know. But of course, I was deeply honored and I was deeply grateful for this experience and to be able to sit with her and to talk to her. She's decided that she's going to retire. Aretha Franklin, the great Aretha Franklin, is going to retire. It's like, you know, sort of been like, you know, the backdrop to my life for as long as I can remember. My mother introduced me to Aretha, my, right? She would listen to her with her girlfriends and they would talk about life and men and what they were doing and their children, you know, and Ain't No Way would be playing in the background. <laughs> I mean, you know, just really amazing, amazing songs. 
And Arifa um, has decided as she goes out that um, as she wraps up her life, her life in the public, is to do a series of songs based on what other singers have done. So that, for instance, she's doing things with Adele's music. And for those of you who have, who have not heard it, I really do suggest that you go home and you pull up on YouTube Adele singing Rolling in the Deep and then follow that with Aretha's Rolling in the Deep. They are both fabulous. They're both fabulous. I love both of them. But what Aretha does, what Aretha does with this song, the way that she bends this song to her, her will and to her voice and to her energy, half the time you have no idea what she's even saying. Right? You know, I mean, you know, like, like, like the, the ideas, the ideas become so abstract, right? That the utterance doesn't need to be sort of the clarity of word, but rather the clarity of emotion, right? The clarity of emotion, and that is the place that she takes us. And I think for me, this is the place that any number of artists happen to take me. The clarity of their vision, the clarity of their emotion, the clarity of their exactitude. And I'm not giving you all of their names because it doesn't matter, right? For those of you who know, you know. For those of you who don't, it doesn't matter. Then, you know, they're, you know, sort of thinking, you know, very particularly about, you know, like certain kinds of artists, like, you know, so I, you know, love, you know, Marcel Duchamp. Love that work. He doesn't love me, which has been a problem, <laughs> you know? But I'm interested in the way in which somebody, which, the, the way Lorna Simpson sort of brings that energy forward, remakes and recontextualizes, representing, representing herself, her body, her ideas, her time, her moment, right? And using something that we already know and sub subverting it, turning it up on its head. Another great, great, great painting. Love this painting, right? But the way also in which, you know, somebody like Micheline bends this material to her will in sort of, you know, sort of positioning uh, this sort of form, the black body within, within, um, within the, the classical terrain sort of disrupting ideas about modernism, extending ideas about modernism, and extending ideas about invention, which is even more important. Ideas about invention. And so I go back to these artists all the time around the notion of invention, right? What is, what is your level of invention as you struggle to make, right? Knowing that nothing that you will ever do is completely original because there is no such thing anymore. There is no such thing anymore, right? But how do you nevertheless take it and make it your own? The origins of the world. And then this image made, you know, 200 years later by Duchamp again. One of the pieces that I go see over and over and over and over and over. This way in which the body begins to be dealt with and thought of, starting with the origins of the world in the first instance, to this complete desecration of the female form later, right? Where the female form is completely discarded, right? To be eaten up by nature. It's an unbelievable piece, a fabulous piece. For those of you who don't know it, you should. So, you know, so I'm, so I'm, I'm thinking about these artists and many, 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 many others. We, we don't have a lot of time tonight, but I wanted to sort of introduce you to some of the projects and some of the ideas and some of the artists that are influencing me. Thank you, Nikki, for bringing up um, past tense and future perfect, you know, always sort of the sort of play on words, thinking about the ways in which we might um, look at, think about these institutions, these institutions, these extraordinary institutions that um, have been sitting for a long time um, without our presence. And knowing, of course, you know, by now, by, you know, 2020, 2020, 2015, 20, you know, 30, you know, we'll all be up for grabs, right? This amazing shift that's taking place, this huge demographic shift that's taking place. And I've been thinking about this huge demographic shift for about 35 years now, right? And now, you know, it's on us. It's just right around the corner, what the Guggenheim will be, what the Park Avenue Armory will be, what this institution will be, what any major institution will be without the shape of us will be a problem, right? 
and now everybody is on notice, right? Everybody's on notice and everybody's on notice in a very real way for the first time in the last few years. And so all of this stuff around sort of, you know, social justice, all the stuff around, you know, sort of social enterprise and sort of inner cities, all of that is a part of that movement that is going on now. I suppose, you know, um, you know, Kitchen Table Series is one of the, you know, uh, first uh, bodies of work that um, kind of separated me uh, in a way. It really sort of separated what I was doing. A lot of people have paid attention to this work, and I really wish you could bring these lights down just a little bit more, you know. Um, filming me is not so important, but showing the audience the images is. So um, working with this material was very important to me teasing out the ways in which I needed to represent, the ways that I thought about representation, the ways that I thought about the female form, the way I thought about sort of personal narrative, uh, the way I thought about it, not simply as, you know, sort of like the personal, because I always think about the personal, it's simply like just, just the beginning of something to deal with things that are really far larger than myself. The work is always far larger than me. I'm simply like a vehicle for, um, for the articulation of a certain kind of experience, that I stand in for something that is greater than myself. And teasing that out has been really, really important. And how do you use the body? How do you use yourself as a kind of a marker and a zone? And why can't you turn off the lights? <laughs> you know, how do you use yourself as kind of like a marker and a zone? You know, and how do you use light in the simple Simplest way, you know. I'm always interested, sort of like in the economy of means. In the economy of means, I'm not sure where I'm going with this. Okay, right. In the economy of means, and sort of using things in, in a very simple, uh, simple, elegant, and stripped down way. You know that you only need what you need, and that a part of it seems to me like the greatest responsibility that I have to myself and to the work is my ability to get out of the way of the work so that the work can actually do what it needs to do, right? Most of us are belaboring, right? Belaboring how something needs to be. It's, it's so belabored that it, it, that, it, that it becomes rigid, right? It has no movement, it has no, no, no fluid, fluidity, no grace, no compromise, no, no loss, no risk. So getting out of the way of the work is very important. It seems to me that, um, speaking to the artist, that each project has led from one project to the next, and that a part, again, of paying attention to the work is paying attention to what the work is telling you to do next. And that if you're paying attention to the work, encoded in the work is really the beginning of the next project. It's ideas about studying and thinking about and examining the female form and the black body in relationship to ideas about modernism and unpacking that is a constant theme in the work. Using mirror, going back and forth across that is a constant way of working as well. Standing on shaky ground, I posed myself for a critical study, but was no longer certain of the questions to be asked. It was clear I was not Manet's type, and Picasso, who had a way with women, only used me, and Duchamp never even considered me. But it could have been worse. Imagine my fate had Kooning got hold of me. <laughs> you know, I always, you know, you know, like I'm, I'm always thinking about the ways in which I might be complicit in what happens. What is my responsibility to self? In any relationship, what is my responsibility to self and how am I acting in this relationship to tease out sort of the ways in which you have a deeper experience? Because nothing is ever binary. There are no blacks and whites. There are all those gray tones in between, right? And it's the gray zone that's really the most interesting part of it. So what is the mess of the thing? And getting to, I think, the sort of questioning of self becomes then the mess of the thing. So I am always thinking about culpability as much as I'm thinking about the thing that I'm engaged in and the thing that I'm actually critiquing. Seduce, seduced by one another, yet bound by certain social conventions. You framed me and I framed you. But we were both framed by modernism. 
And even though we knew better, we continued that time-honored tradition of the artist and his model. Coming back again to this idea that you are, you are involved in a relationship, and what is the nature of that relationship that you're involved in, and how do you critique it? And how do you critique not only you know, like yourself in relationship to man, right, or man critiquing his relationship to woman, but the social order, the social order, and then the social order and the social construct of the social order, but then also its relationship to, to art itself and the production itself, right, to modernism itself, right, to the ideas of invention itself. The ways, of course, I think that are really important, you see, the ways in which African-American artists, for the most part, have been thought of has not been as inventors of the form in the form, great participants in the form, right? And so we're always relegated to the side. You were always relegated other to modernism, other to the larger practice, right? It's that African-American stuff that's over here, that different shit that's over here. And in the process of that, it all has to do with also marketability. What's seen, where is it seen? What institutions is it seen in? How is it acquired? Who acquires it? And what is its value? The difference between the value, the perceived value of the work of the highest paid woman in the world, right? The most money ever paid for the highest. I think it's maybe, it could be um, Georgia O'Keeffe, maybe, one of her, her paintings. The distance, the distance between the next male figure within the canon, the difference is like millions of dollars. Millions of dollars, not like one million or two million, but like five or six or eight or nine. I mean, like, I mean the, these differences are enormous. Enormous. So this has like real implications. It's not, it's not just a thing. It's not just a complaint. It's about the, sort of the structure, an economic structure around artistic production and how that, ar that artistic production is perceived and by whom at what cost to the artist. I mean, I think it's really fascinating. And it all begins with simply, you know, are we involved as creative entities within the practice of the modern debate, the modern discourse, or are we functioning on the side? And for me, I think it's really important to be looked at and to be investigated. These sort of um, broad categories, um, you know, they, they've been really interesting. I really, you know, I, I work every day. Like, not like every other day. You know, I work like every day. And, you know, I mean, you know, getting up to me, my, my husband wakes up and it's like, you know, I was thinking about, you know, sort of the social construct. Is he, you know, he's saying, can I have my coffee? Can I have my coffee first, baby? From here I saw what happened and I cried. Um, Deb and I have, are working on um, a book through uh, the Peabody Museum at Harvard around this particular piece. Many, many, many things have happened around this particular work. And I'm only going to show you a few slides because we really don't have so much time this evening. It's a large piece that was actually a commission. I like doing commissions because no matter what happens, you get paid. From here I saw what happened and I cried. You became a scientific profile. A Negroid type. An anthropological debate. And a photographic subject. And then the piece goes on to sort of deconstruct in a number of ways, in a number of ways, over, over maybe 35 images, I think, in all, over about 35 images. It sort of has, again, this sort of thing where I'm not only looking at um, the, the, the black subject, but I'm also looking at ideas about American history. I'm also looking at ideas about um, photographic history and the use of the African American within that photographic history and the role of photography within the history of American subject making. I mean, so there are all of these sort of positions that, are, that can be sort of unpacked in relationship to it. And any number of things happened around this particular project. It's been interesting, it's been exciting. It was one of the first major pieces, actually, that I used sort of appropriate 
investigated work. These four images come from Harvard University. It was fascinating. I had like huge, huge, huge debates and questions and problems with all of these sort of institutions who decided that they really didn't want me to use their images. Harvard really didn't want me to use the images. They said that they were going to sue me if I used the images. And then I thought, well, it'd be perfect if you sued me. <laughs> It would probably be really great because I thought there would be a, a great conversation to really have in public around these specific images and how these particular images came to be made. And then, you know, Harvard decided, okay. <laughs> All right, so we're not gonna sue her. We're not gonna sue her. But then they decided to buy the images. And so that was a very interesting thing because they had given me sort of the stipulation that any time I sold the images, I had to give them 20%. So I wasn't sure if I needed to give Harvard 20% once I sold them to them. It was a very complicated thing. It was like one of those sort of wonderful, wonderful, wonderful kind of moments, right? Right? This is great. You know, and so, and so the, the, the thing about the work, the thing that's been important about the work is that it has really sort of set these sort of new parameters, these sort of guidelines, these sort of really Great um, strokes, and so now you know any number of lawyers have written about it, and now there's this important book that uh, Deborah has been working on that brings uh, much of this uh, material uh, to uh, the fore once again in a new kind of way. And you know when I'm not doing that, sometimes I you know I really just want to make you know photographs of like flowers, <laughs> you know, because really you know really the work is complicated and it is emotional, and it is deep, and you don't do it easily, that it's, um, that it's this sort of deep exploration of idea and emotion and concern and an unpacking, and it's this sort of struggle to get toward something that has to do with um, justice and humanity and its com complicated nature. Ideas about color have informed my work since the very, very beginning, and I've been playing with ideas about color. That nothing is ever black or white. You know, that things are deep and complex, and there's high yellow, and there's jet black, and there's blue green, and there are all these other things that are going on that informs color, that people are residing behind color, and color is riding on top of them, and there are all these sort of squares in which we sort of think about this range of color to play in, a feel to play in. And so I, I've gone back to this again and again and again. You know, you know there are only sort of maybe a, a few moves that I've, I've really made. Right? I think you only make a few moves. Hi, Leslie, how are you? It's great to see your family here, Deb. Um, you know, this, um, these, these sort of ways of working, these very simple installations, the ways of grouping material, of grouping photographs, of thinking about structure. I didn't know that I was fascinated with architecture until my photographs really told me that I was really fascinated with architecture and using architecture to tell me where we were, what was happening. Looking at the slave coast, the structure of slavery, the construction of slavery, the architecture of slavery, and then using a certain kind of language to play along with that. Or thinking about, you know, sort of the sort of amazing way that architecture begins to define something about who belongs in a space, right? Whether it's a feminine space or a male space, right? We deal with that all the time here in the West as well, but in certain places it's much more evident, right? This beautiful, beautiful sense of the female space. Right? Laid out, laid out beautifully, you know, in the architecture. And then, you know, you know, when I when I was a young girl, you know, I saw a Gidget goes to Rome. <laughs> right? And I, you know, I could just like see myself in Rome, you know, in some fabulous dress, you know, on the back of a Vespa with some cute Italian boy, you know, I mean, I just could not wait to go to Rome, you know, I thought that I would just sleep my way across the country. <laughs> but I did not go to Rome, I went to many, many other places, but I didn't go to Rome until much, much, much later in my life, and it, you know, by then it was over, you know what I mean? So all I, you know, all I could do was work. 
And I decided, you know, I mean, one was that I wanted to make a film there. I wanted to see, uh, I wanted to work in Fellini's studio because Fellini, of course, is one of my great heroes. And, you know, also, you know, I was thinking about, you know, my un unrequited love. And, but I also really wanted to look at, you know, sort of like the architecture. And so I'm really happy that I went to uh, Rome much later in my life because then I really knew uh, more about what I wanted to do and how I wanted to go about doing it. <clears throat> And so this is a very fast um, clicker bicker. <laughs> and so, you know, I would get up very early every morning and I would just sort of hit it. I'd just be out there photographing all of these buildings, you know, because I was really sort of thinking about the sort of first place where money was first invented, right, where empire first begins as a thing, you know, and I really wanted to look then at Rome, not simply, you know, just sort of classical Rome, you know, and it's sort of ruins of Rome and all the gates in the city. I went to every gate in the city and I photographed myself at every single gate in the city, but I also wanted to look at Mussolini's Rome, fascist Rome, and the role of architecture, the way in which architecture is Made, it makes you feel in relationship to it. How do you feel in relationship to the building? What is, what is the subject's relationship to the role of the state, whether it's the church or the piazza or the Congress? What is, and, and how do you approach those buildings? How do you use your own sort of physical self to engage them, right? And there's a whole idea, you know, a philosophy around, you know, around the ways in which um, the state wanted its subject to enter a building. And that they should always feel humble to buy the entrance into that building because they were walking into the arms of the state. I mean, you know, these sort of ideas about, you know, these sort of philosophies about architecture were really important to me. And just as I was finishing, as I was talking about earlier, you know, sort of knowing that, you know, the beginning of like the next work is already encoded in the work that you've done before, I made this photograph of a museum. It was my last photograph made on May Day. Made on May Day, you know, like 2007. Right? May Day. May Day for me was always important because my father and my, my family had been involved in May Day as a political holiday. So going out and working on that day was important. I found myself in front of this museum. I make all these photographs myself. I do a lot of running. Uh, and then I realized, of course, that there was something about museums that then I needed to unpack as well. So I went home. I threw a couple of pair of panties and a a bag along with a toothbrush and uh, a brush and uh, some sneakers and my camera. And I just got on the road and took lots of flights all over Europe uh, to make these photographs before I began to come back to the United States. Just again, bearing witness of thinking about what was in these buildings. And this is the only photograph actually that I didn't take myself that I actually roped somebody into. Uh, photographing for me. And then using that also to sort of photograph the monuments in Washington, D.C. So I've been doing this work, you know, there are, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of photographs that are part of each of these uh, bodies of work from the museum series, the Rome series, the Cuba series, the Africa series, you know, the, I just uh, work uh, that way listening devices, constructing pieces of history. At a certain point, I really begin to understand that in large part, that a lot of what had happened in the United States happened in the United States because of all the assassinations that had happened here. We think about that a lot in relationship to the third world, Cuba, uh, you know, Colombia, Venezuela, you know, you know, these sort of corrupt governments, right? And now we have Trump in the White House. It's sort of a fabulous kind of breaking open, a wonderful kind of revelation for where we really are as a country, how divided we really are as a nation. And of course, half of that responding to uh, this quaking, this shift, this fracture that's happening in the country as it moves uh, from black to, uh, from, from white to, to, to brown. The assassination of Martin and of Megger and of the Kennedy boys, John and Robert. These are amazing, I mean, this is like phenomenal. This is phenomenal stuff. In a way, we have a certain kind of distance from it now, I think. Maybe some of the younger people in the room 
all these bad sisters, you know, have a certain kind of distance. But, but, but for me, it really does shape and give um, a sense of who we are, the character of who we are. Looking at popular culture, large pieces that I decided that I needed to go look at this sort of shift that was taking place on network TV with shows like Scandal, How to Get Away with Murder, really sort of shifting the ways in which the black body and black film, black ideas are being expressed on TV. And even though I'm not like, like a huge fan of, 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 of How to Get Away with Murder, not really, I'm really appreciative of what, of what they are and what, and what Sandra is doing on this show. I mean, you know, I saw like, a, like an episode last week that was absolutely amazing around, you know, like the, you know, the black body and what happens to black men, right? And sort of questions of social justice and the law. It was a phenomenal show. It was a phenomenal speech, right? So I'm not like a huge fan of her show, but I'm a huge fan of what she's producing. And so I thought that I should just go stand in those places too. So I've spent a lot of time over the last uh, year and a half standing in all of these, going to these movie sets and TV sets and meeting all these people. <laughs> and it's been kind of a, it's been kind of a wonderful, it's been a wonderful way of, a wonderful way of working. And the text, of course, is an interesting text, but I can't, I don't think I have time to really sort of share it with you um, today. Uh, but they are around, I think that many of them are online, I think. And so if you're really interested, maybe in reading the text, you'll go to uh, the website. But you know, the, but, but the gist of it is, the, just the gist, is it was, it's a story about a woman who understands what has taken place in popular culture, who has arrived too late. She simply arrived too late. And so she's looking at these sort of shifts that are taking place in culture, and she's questioning her role in this culture as she realizes that it's just slightly too late for her to participate. It's kind of a wonderful, thoughtful, uh, interesting text. I'm going to talk um, very quickly um, about uh, the sort of last piece. I started doing, I've been doing um, this work for a long, 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 long time. And nobody pays me really to do the work that I do. I, nobody gives me a suggestion about what I might want to do. For the artists that are out here, it always seems to me that the most important thing to do is to figure out what it is that you are committed to. What is it you care about? What is it that gives the work meaning and what gives your life meaning? And if you can figure out what it is that you deeply care about, right? Whether anybody else likes it doesn't really matter. The most important thing is you're figuring out what it is that you genuinely care about and doing that work in the most authentic way that you can. So I started an institute because I, as much as, you know, I'm really not all that into kids, but I do work with them. And I think that, that it's important to work with them. And uh, they've given me a tremendous amount. Um, and I care, I deeply, deeply care about what happens to kids. And so there were a lot of things that were going on in my community, a lot of disruption that was happening in the community a lot of violence that was happening in the community. And I thought that maybe I needed to do something uh, working with kids and introducing them to ideas about how they might work, uh, knowing that uh, some of the di greatest difficulty is between and amongst you know, young men between the ages of 18 and 25. So how do you work with those young people? How do you bring them closer to something? How do you offer skill? How do you train them? How do you set up those kinds of institutions? And so the Institute of Sound and Style was one of the ways that I went about doing that. So um, I thought that, um, you know, and of course this, this, all of this sort of continues and it continues into this sort of last piece that I'm going to, to share with you. They're, they're giving me like that, that, that sign. Um, so I, I, I make my photographs, I do my concerts, I work with many, uh, 
with many different artists. I pull artists together. I do convenings. Uh, and uh, because, again, I can't help myself. I, you know, I'm deeply curious about what people are up to. And then I also do performance, sometimes, just sometimes. And a couple of years ago, I decided after all of this was going on with um, young men and the killing of so many young black men, so many, so many, um, I started thinking about this project. It's called Grace Notes, Reflections for Now. Grace Notes, Reflections for Now. And I thought, well, you know, I started the project and I couldn't, I couldn't really wrap my head around completely the meaning of grace. You know, I, I had mounted the, the, the work, I was doing the work, I was, had presented the work, but I really could not wrap my mind around the meaning of grace. What was it? And how would I describe it? How would I talk about it? And I called my pastor, and I called my friends, and I spoke to people that I didn't know. And then I called my mother. And this conversation that I had with my mother about the meaning of grace is probably one of the greatest conversations that I've had with anyone. I used to think that I took after my father. My father, my, my mother said that, that uh, in our lives, our father was like the sun, and everything rose and set in my father. And so we couldn't see my mother for a long time. Do you know what I mean? It was really deep. And then my father passed away a few years ago, and, uh, and my mother stepped forward. And I heard her speak at the funeral of her brother, the first sibling that died in my mother's family. And my mother opened her mouth and I thought, oh my God. This is my mother. When I um, made kitchen table, Dad, when I made kitchen table, when I made kitchen table, I was very confused. I was lost. I, I would get up every day and I'd cry. You know, I cry myself all the way to, the, to my dark room. And then I work and I work with my students and I cry my way all back, all the way back home. I just cried and cried and cried. I listened to music and cried, trying to figure out how to make this work. How to make this work, how to get at what I was trying to get at, how to do that. And then I remembered that one morning, my mother called. And I thought, oh my God, I sound just like my mother. I heard my voice in my mother. And I was able to make a work. I think there was something about getting sort of, you know, to the authentic self, that my mother was helping me to get to my authentic self and was asking and answering questions for me that, um, that in a way she has become my greatest influencer that she is the greatest influence in my life. Not simply as my mother, but as a sort of extraordinary woman with an extraordinary mind, an extraordinary capacity, who really understands like things in a really deep way, but very, very humble, very humble. And these ideas about compassion and unconditional love, right, and this, this, this way in which you are always open, that you are always giving, regardless of what happens, that you were always extending, 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 and offering up the best of who you are under all circumstances, becomes the sort of source and the power of what grace is. So I'm trying to answer these questions, and I'm trying to sort of think about the ways that I need to sort of answer this question about grace, that I need to sort of make this work around these, all of these young black men who have lost their lives. And then, and then one night, um, I had this amazing dream, and all of this is sort of connected in sort of some way, I'm not sure how, but they're all connected. And one night I, I went to bed, and uh, I had this, I saw this like giant 
this sort of giant wall of water. This giant wall of water was just coming. Right? This huge, I mean, it was like, it was like, it was like just this terrifying tsunami that was just rising up out of the sea and it was coming, right? You know, and I see this thing coming and I'm afraid and I want to hold on to my life and I want to warn my friends that this tsunami is coming, that something is coming that is threatening us, it's going to wipe us out. We have to run for our lives. And I'm running and I turn to my right and there's Trump. leering at me, and I run past Trump, and I'm crying, and I'm running towards my friends, and then, and then I see Martin Furrier, who, who, do you all know Martin Furrier? Martin Furrier's great, 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 great ladder was there, and all of my friends were climbing it. And they were singing, we were climbing Jacob's ladder as they climbed. It was amazing. You know, not like as a hymn, but it's like a protest song. Right? I mean, it was, just, it was just absolutely, it was absolutely amazing. And so, and so that there is a way, there's a way that we can, in all of this, there's a way that we can save ourselves, that we know that we are up against mighty, 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 mighty forces that are threatening us that are threatening our men. So, um, young brother who's back there with the video camera, can we do two, two things? Um, is it possible just to bring the, the highest, the, these lights down just a little bit? Or is that kind of where we are? So can we um, see the video, people of a darker hue? It starts just at about 8, 13. Um, you have that, right? Okay, let me find my, my stuff. <clears throat> this is a video work that's inside this uh, larger piece for Grace Notes. Volume down, bring down the volume down just a little bit. I think we know uh, a lot of things about power. It was a kind of amazing report that came out the other day that, you know, if black men, white men start at the same level economically, there's a tendency that white men will do quite well, and there's a tendency that black men will not that they will sink closer to the bottom. I thought that it was sort of a remarkable report, and I think it speaks profoundly to where we are in this country, and that it's steeply related to the killing of young black men. This idea of the emasculation of men, the destruction of black men, is key to a certain way of thinking. And if we don't understand that, I think we are in deep trouble. They were no strangers to sorrow. And time and time again, the man was rejected and the woman was denied. A man was killed and his body lay in the open, exposed and uncovered. Women wailed and men moaned. For reasons unknown, I saw him running, I saw him stop. I saw him turn with raised hands. I heard a shot and I saw him fall. For reasons unknown, I rejected my own knowledge and I deceived myself by refusing to believe that any of this was possible. And so their rights were denied. And the people said little, and they did even less.
This violence was not like it was in the movies. There are no fast cuts, no zooms, no pans, no fades, no close-ups. He was 22. He was 36. He was 25. He was 43. He was 27. A father, a brother, an uncle, a boy, a child, a friend. He was 25. He was 43. He was 27. He was 18. A brother, an uncle, a cousin, a husband, a friend. She was 31. She was 28. She was 34. A mother, a wife. He was 25. He was 29. He was 31. A father, a cousin, a boy, a friend. Partner. The man was rejected. The woman was denied. He was trying to get out his ID and his wallet out his um, pocket, and the officer just shot him in his arm. We're waiting for a back. I will, sir. No worries. I will. He just shot his arm off. Told him not to reach for it. I told him to get his hand out. He had you told him to get his ID, sir, his driver's license. Oh my god, please don't tell me he's dead. Please don't tell me my boyfriend just went like that. Keep your hands where they are. Yes, I will, sir. I'll keep my hands where they are. Please don't tell me this, Lord. Please, Jesus, don't tell me that he's gone. Please don't tell me that he's gone. Please, officer, don't tell me that you just did. It's a constant, it's a constant, it's a constant, it's a constant, it's a constant. There are simply too, too many of our young boys that are dying for no reason. And very few people have been charged. Very few police officers have been charged, have been convicted. The man was rejected. The woman was denied. A man was killed. The body lie in the open, uncovered and exposed. Women wailed and men moaned. For reasons unknown, I saw him running. I saw him stop, and I saw him turn with raised hands. I heard a shot. I saw him fall. But for reasons unknown, I rejected my own knowledge, and I deceived myself by refusing to believe that any of this was possible. And so the people said that all, and they did even less. And the violence was not like it is in the movies. 
There are no fast cuts, no pans, no zooms, no close-ups. Reality happens in slow motion and in somber color. Thank you. Somebody coming up to say something to somebody? Oh, I think there's a party, there are cocktails, there are all kinds of things that are happening. Hi, everybody. If you could just hold on for two minutes. Um, my name is Nick Klein. I'm the founder and director of Shine Portrait Studio. Um, I would like to invite you to the opening reception of Deborah Willis's extraordinary exhibition, In Pursuit of Beauty, Imaging Newark's Closets and Beyond. Um, the exhibition is on all three floors of Express Newark uh, throughout the interstitial um, shared spaces. And um, we have uh, bars and food and uh, artwork uh, winding throughout. And, um, so yeah, please, please do make your way around and uh, we're, we're also doing complimentary portraits in Shine Portrait Studio. Um, I wanna welcome especially, um, special welcome to Karen May Weems um, and thank you for sharing um, the event of your lecture with our opening reception. Thank you. Welcome back Dr. Nikki Green. Um, thank you. We're, we're Fortunate to have artist Iveria Simmons, who is going to be our, our guest DJ tonight. Um, and a special welcome to those who have just returned from the Black Portraitures Conference at Harvard. Um, that's right, I see a lot of familiar faces. Um, Shine Portrait Studio and Express Newark is committed to the critical and essential work of the Black Portraitures community. Shine is a socially engaged art project manifested through revisiting the traditional neighborhood portrait studio, and this has particular resonance because we stand on the very site where James van der Zee had his first professional photography job. So um, one of Shine's um, exciting initiatives is the invitation of a curator in residence to work here in Newark and imagine and present an exhibition of artwork that engages deeply with the city. And uh, Shine's first invited curator is Dr. Kalia Brooks Nelson, and um, I think she's really cold at the moment. <laughs> so, um, so I invite you, um, you know, all to um, go and see the show. And, and finally, an, uh, um, a heartfelt thank you to uh, Dr. Deb. Um, although you've had ties to Newark, um, the city, for many years, um, thank you for being a part of Shine and Express Newark's community. So um, thank you very much for um, coming, everybody. And there's lots of food and uh, music, so let's, let's celebrate. Thank you. Don't go, don't go. And a big round of applause for Nate. <laughs> 